Uh, Mr. Lentz, thanks for being here. You're on our second panel. Uh, we have James E. Lentz, who is the President and Chief Operating Officer of Toyota Motor Sales USA Incorporated. As you know, it's the policy of the subcommittee take all testimony under oath. Please be advised that you have the right under the rules of the House to be advised by counsel during your testimony. Do, do you wish to be represented by counsel? Yes, uh, Ted Hester is behind me. Okay, Mr. Hester is here then, and you may consult with him during any time, but if he testifies, we'll then place him under oath at the appropriate time. Thank you. So I'd ask you, please rise, raise your right hand, take the oath. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, matter pending before this committee. I do. Let the record reflect the witnesses under, uh, replied in the affirmative. He is now under oath. Uh, Mr. Lentz, if you'd like to begin with an opening statement, um, five minutes. If you have a longer statement, we'll be happy to submit it for the record. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Chairman Stupak, Ranking Member Burgess, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me here today. My name is Jim Lentz. I am the President and Chief Operating Officer of Toyota Motor Sales USA. I'm honored to return here to represent the 30,000 Americans who work for Toyota and the many thousands more from our dealerships and supplier that bring great dedication and spirit to their jobs each and every day. Three months ago, I told this committee that Toyota is committed to strengthening our focus on safety and quality assurance and communicating effectively with our customers and regulators. In subsequent hearings, four of my senior colleagues from the U.S. and Japan, including our president, Akio Toyota, also pledged to improve Toyota's uh, response on safety issues. Today, I would like to update the committee on substantial progress we've made in honoring those commitments. We are taking major steps to become a more responsive, safety-focused organization, listening closely to our customers, responding more quickly to their concerns and those of our regulators, and taking concrete actions to ensure that we are among the industry leaders in safety. Mr. Toyota has made improving quality assurance his top priority, and our entire company is mobilized to ensure that Toyota vehicles are safe and reliable for our customers, not only when they're first sold and leased, but as they're on the road for many years to come. Under Mr. Toyota's personal leadership, we've undertaken a top-to-bottom review of our quality assurance process in all aspects of our global operations. Importantly, Toyota's appointed a new Chief Quality Officer for North America, a U.S. executive with more than three decades of manufacturing expertise to act as the voice of the customer in this region. North America now has a greater say on recalls and other safety-related issues that affect vehicles sold here in the United States. In fact, the Chief Quality Officer has a direct line to Mr. Toyota when it comes to ensuring our customers' safety. These changes are having a real impact, as reflected in the speed and decisiveness of our response last month when Consumer Reports identified a potential software issue with the vehicle stability control in the 2010 Lexus GX 460. In addition, our smart evaluation process has significantly improved the speed of our response to customer reports of unintended acceleration. SMART stands for Swift Market Analysis Response Team, and at its core are 200 highly trained engineers and field technicians who can be deployed anywhere in the U.S. to investigate customer reports of unintended acceleration on site. Under this new evaluation process, the company has completed more than 600 on-site vehicle inspections. And our dealership technicians have completed an additional 1,400 inspections. These examinations are giving us a better understanding about the reasons for unintended acceleration complaints. Significantly, none of these investigations have found that our electronic throttle control system with intelligence, or ETCSI, was the cause. We're now making an extraordinary effort to service our recalled vehicles and equip all of our new cars and trucks with an even more advanced safety technologies, including our star safety system, brake override, and improved event data recorders, or EDRs, that will read both pre- and post-crash data. Our dealers have completed nearly 3.5 million recall remedies. That's more than 70% of the sticky pedal modifications and will continue to reach out to the affected owners to make sure that they bring their vehicles to their dealer's attention. We're grateful to our customers for the way that they're standing by Toyota. 
Consistent with our pledge to Congress, we now have 150 EDR readout units in North America and have delivered 10 EDR readers to NHTSA so that they can conduct their own data retrieval from Toyota vehicles during their investigations. Additionally, Toyota is well on its way to being the first full-line manufacturer to feature brake override technology as standard equipment on all the vehicles sold in the United States. Brake override will be available across our entire product lineup by the end of 2010. We're also taking the extraordinary step of retrofitting brake override on seven existing models involved in the recalls as an additional measure of confidence for our customers. Toyota remains confident that our ETCSI system is not the cause of unintended acceleration. Toyota and Lexan vehicles are inherently designed so that real-world uncommanded acceleration of the vehicle cannot occur. We test our vehicles extensively to make sure that the fail-safes and redundancies work. Nonetheless, we're making a major scientific effort to further validate the safety of our vehicles by opening up our technology to an unprecedented level of independent review by respected safety, quality, and engineering experts. The engineering and scientific consulting firm Exponent has already completed more than 11,000 hours of testing and the analysis of the ETCSI system, and its comprehensive evaluation is ongoing. I've been advised by Secretary Slater that the quality advisory panel he chairs will invite a rigorous peer review of that process as part of its assessment of exponents' findings. And it will be one of the topics of a discussion when the panel meets with Mr. Toyota next week in Japan. As Mr. Toyota told Secretary LaHood, we're pleased to cooperate fully with NHTSA and through NHTSA with the engineers from NASA in their independent evaluation of our ETSCI system. We also cooperate with the National Academy of Sciences on their evaluation of Toyota and Lexus vehicles as they study the industry-wide issue of automotive safety. Members of the committee, at Toyota we are committed to doing more than just correcting mistakes from the past. We're learning from them and we're making major steps to avoid them in the future. I'd like to quote the words of Mike Getz, a Toyota team member for 22 years from Georgetown, Kentucky plant. In one team on all levels, a book which it, uh, is, means what it is to work at our plant in Kentucky. And it's written by the team members of the Georgetown plant. Mike writes, Toyota makes mistakes, but we're expected to. Take ownership to find out why and ensure that we learn from them and prevent reoccurrence. And we just don't say that, we actually do that. That's been the Toyota way for 70 years. For the future, by acting swiftly on safety issues whenever they arise, we're determined to set a new standard for quality customer care for vehicles on the road. Our goal is to lead the way for our industry. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Mr. Lentz, and thank you again for being here. Uh, let me start. I asked uh, Mr. Strickland, but let me ask you this question. Um, last time you were here in February, you testified that the mats and the sticky pedal accounted for about 16 percent of the sudden unintended acceleration, and that's 84 percent of them we cannot, we have no answer for. Are we any closer to finding out what about those other 84 percent of the sudden unintended acceleration? What's the cause of it? Well, I, I think part of it is it depends on the, the database that you're looking at. In the, in the case of NHTSA's database, um, it's, it's glumped together as speed control. So it includes not only events of sudden unintended acceleration, but it includes any other type of surge or hesitation event. So when, when we spoke last, I'm, I'm confident of, of three things. I am, I am confident that the sticky pedal is being repaired. We're already almost 70% repaired. Correct. I am, I am confident that we are going to be under control on the mats. I'm confident that ETC. But even if you do 100% mats, 100% sticky pedal, we still have 84% of two, th and these were the numbers we used last time. Here's our 2,262 sudden acceleration report since 1999. 815 crashes, 341 injuries, 19 deaths in the United States. So. The 84% was from the 2262, so that means 
84% of them, even if you did 100% match, even if you did 100% sticky pedal, we still have 84%. We don't have an answer for. You tell us you have 11,000 hours uh, that Exponent has done. What did they conclude? What, what did those tests show? We have no reports. They won't give us any reports. So what did 11,000 hours of testing, what was it about? What well, was it on? What well, was on electronics? Was it on well, computer? Was it on the microprocessors? We, we don't know because... Uh, exponent won't provide us the information. Well, a cu couple different questions in there. Uh, a lot of questions there. There are a lot of questions in there. Um, first off, in, in, in terms of surges and hesitations, uh, the possibility of pedal misapplication, even though we're going to do these two mechanical fixes, those are still going to exist. And they still can be reported to NHTSA as speed control because it's such a broad category. That's part of that 84% number that, that's in that number. Uh, in terms of um, exponent and the, the scope of their work, they provided the committee back, I believe, around the time that I testified. An interim report, that's all we interim, received. interim, very, very preliminary right. on, on a small portion of what they're testing. Um, I, I believe yesterday they provided a, a second report to you all um, with more information but they, they, are, they are testing not only vehicle electronics, they are testing uh, uh, EMI, they are, they are, they are testing um, everything that could possibly create unintended acceleration. Right. I, I guess I would agree with you, but you come and say we're doing everything and Exponent has this open-ended uh, ability to do what needs to be done. You testify there's 11,000 hours. Uh, and what Exponent says, and all we have is this February, it says, it's important to note at this stage of our work, we neither claim to have looked at all issues nor have opined on the causes of the incidents of unattended acceleration that have been reported. We agree that further work needs to be performed before we reach such opinions and further work is underway. And when we ask, we, we, we receive no reports. We just say, well, work is underway. Is all this in some engineers or scientists had, no one writes down what they're doing for 1,100 hours, how, how, would, how would you even pay them? I mean, we have their payment schedule, $485 for this person or that person. Uh, how, how in the heck do you know if you're getting anything for your money? Well, you know, I, I, I'm convinced that in the end, when we see the final report, and it is going to be made public, it will be peer reviewed, and, and uh, Secretary Slater is also going to review what's taking place. Um, I'm, I'm confident that with what they're doing, we will see a very independent report, number one. Um, number two. Um, when, when are we going to see a final report? I, I, I don't have an exact date. We we're, are, we're holding NASA to the end of August. Can we have exponents final report by the end of August? I don't think that they have committed to me a given date. Uh, but, I, but I will tell you this, that in the case of Exponent, you're right, I've listened to the comments in the past, that they were reporting through uh, product liability attorneys. That changed this week. Uh, Steve St. Angelo, as we continue to expand the quality officer's job in North America, Steve St. Angelo, Exponent is now reporting to Steve St. Angelo, and all of their work will report through Steve St. Angelo. Uh, and I know we have a conference call next week, as we do every week, with the Quality Task Force. And I'm sure Steve, being from, he's the, from the manufacturing engineering side, he okay. is going to demand that we have a work process with Exponent going forward. And as soon as we have that, you will have that. Well, okay, your, your um, counsel has sort of indicated that their Exponent's contract did not change at all. So is this going to be a new change that's bring it about or is going to be reduced to writing about who they're going to report to and how they're going to get this to your uh, safety? A letter has already gone to um, Sabaya at uh, Exponent from Steve San Angelo. Okay. When you get a chance, uh, would you get it to the committee, if we don't mind? See, just, can we just see the document? Yeah, it, it was submitted with a written statement. Okay. All right. So now let me ask you just one last question. My time's up. Uh, is there going to be a recall tomorrow on these um, Lexus LS vehicles? I, I don't know for certain the timing. Okay, but uh, there's going to be a recall of some there, of these vehicles on yes. a steering problem, correct? Yeah, and, and it is because of the experience in Japan. The, this, the steering component that, that creates this 
is standard in Japan on all LSs. Right. And, and that's a computer-driven steering issue? It's, it's computer-driven. Have we had any uh, complaints here in this country about the steering we, we, on these? We have not had any complaints, but now that Japan has had the issue, we're combing through our files to see if there's anything. It's on roughly 50 percent of the LSs in the United States. It's not standard on all vehicles in the U.S. Okay. like it is in Japan. You about 3,800 vehicles here in the United States, I think it is? Yeah, about 30. I think 24, 2,500 that have been sold and about 1,400 that are either in dealer stock, port okay. stock, or on the way to us that could be impacted. Okay. Mr. Burgess, for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lance, thank you for being with us again this afternoon. Um, Mr. Chairman Stupak's opening statement made a lot of reference to polling. Uh, he didn't have any questions on it. I'm not sure that I. I'm not sure that I do, but um, would you care to respond to some of the things that uh, some of the the statements that were made in in the opening statement by the chairman of the subcommittee? Yeah, I, we we have uh, the, the polling company of I can't recall their name right now, but um, they have done polls for us for about three years. Benenson Strategy Group? Benenson, yes, I'm sorry. Um, they've done polls for us for about the last three years. They've probably done at least two dozen polls in the past. Uh, the, the poll that's in question was done soon after my testimony. It was done soon after the ABC uh, expose ran about unintended acceleration. And there were questions within that uh, that asked questions about Dr. Gilbert and about Sean Kane and about ABC. There were a lot of other questions of the things that we're measuring as well. But yes, we, we did do research polling um, about the, uh, uh, the work done by Dr. Gilbert. Can you, if it's not proprietary, can you give us an idea of the sample size, the, the polling sample size? I believe it was around 1,000. I, I, I may not be exact. We'll find out it was 980 or 990. Of course, you would have no reason to publicly state the fact that you're doing a poll. Typically, a, a company would not publicize that it's polling because that might influence the results of the poll. Is that correct? Correct. Now, um, have you, you did this in response to the ABC News piece. Have, is it unusual for, for your company to do polling related to other issues of the day that may relate to, to your particular industry? Well, I think it is, but I, but I think the ABC News piece was very unusual as well. Uh, I mean, it was, it was a, a clear attack on uh, the reputation of the company and, and the uh, uh, really cast doubt about electronic throttle control systems. So we, we felt it was very, very important to our, to our customers, to our dealers. But, sir, if you didn't make it public, and it was obviously in your best interest not to go public with that information. Well, who did? Made which public? The poll, the poll on, on, the, uh, on the ABC News hit piece, uh, ABC News piece. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. But you did not, and your company did I, not. I, not to my knowledge, no. So it was leaked to a usually reliable source, and of course it could we possibly live. be, I don't know. I mean, it's, it, at the time that we were using that, doing that polling, we didn't know how much damage that ABC report had done to our reputation. And we were contemplating whether or not we would have to do newspaper advertising to try to explain our side. And, and quite frankly, the results of the polling indicated that the consumers really didn't know much about what they had said and quite frankly didn't care a lot about it. So we didn't end up doing anything about it. Now you've asked your engineering firm Exponent to review and try to replicate the conditions that Professor Gilbert outlined yes. to us here in the committee. Was that decision made before you commissioned the poll from the Benin's, Benenson Strategy Group? Uh, that, that actually took place the evening before um, my testimony. So when we found out that ABC was running that, uh, Exponent worked that night to see how many other vehicles they could replicate. So that would have been before the polling. And did you run any ads based on the information you received, you retrieved from the polling data? Not that I know of. I mean, there have some of our advertising in terms of uh, Toyota in America has been run based on some of that polling information. But to my understanding, uh, with regard to Gilbert and Kane, I don't believe we've run anything on that. On the, uh, we've had some some talk about the brake overrides and, and fixes for the for the sudden ex unintended acceleration. Um, 
last fall, your company announced it would be installing a brake override on certain models. Will this cover all models of Toyotas that have been the subject of sudden unintended acceleration? The, the, the going back and, and retroactively installing the brake override system? Yeah, not on every single vehicle. The, 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 the first cut to decide where we would put those were really on all vehicles that had the push button start stop. Uh, so Camry, as an example, some models do. We put it across the entire Camry line. Same with IS, same with ES, um, same with, I believe, Avalon. Uh, we, we then took a second cut and took a look at, based on NHTSA's data of high incidence of sudden acceleration, what other vehicles might we add to that for additional consumer confidence? Well, why That's wouldn't you just add it to all models for consumer confidence? Well, it's, it, it's an additional 8 million vehicles. Um, in, in some cases, some of those models, when you look at the NHTSA database, actually has a much less than average incident rate of sudden acceleration. Um, it's, it's, it's not the same across all vehicles on, on the Toyota or Lexus side. Um, and, and, and I think part of it is the, the tremendous amount of engineering resource and time that it takes to do that would but be very, very it, difficult. You're trying to rebuild consumer confidence after a very damaging yes. series of events the past eight months. that does seem like it would make sense if that's the way to repair consumer confidence, add the, add the feature and, and then none of the rest of us have to worry. Will that brake override system prevent every and all instance and type of sudden unintended acceleration? It, it only works if you step on the brake. Okay. Let me, uh, let me, let me ask you this if, if I could. Much longer. Yeah. <laughs> You've been very indulgent. I, I just want to say, at least in my part of the world, that your dealerships have done an excellent job opening early, staying late. And I've had multiple anecdotal experiences from people, my own experience with your dealership in, in Louisville. Uh, I think they have done very well by your company in, in what was a, a pretty tough time. They stepped up, uh, met the challenge, and uh, and have taken it, have met it head on. So. Uh, plaudits to your dealers in the North Texas area. They are doing a great job. Thank you. They're, they're tremendous partners of ours, and they, they understand the value of taking care of customers. So thank you. Mr. Chairman, Chairman Waxman for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lentz, I'm, I'm, I'm still confused because, uh, as I hear what you're saying, Exponent is continuing to do research for you, but they're not going to do it for the trial lawyers. They're going to do it for one of your corporate executives. Who's will be I, I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive. I, I think as, as it has evolved. Okay, so they're still doing research. Yes. And you've told them to do a comprehensive evaluation, spare no budget, yes. do everything that needs to be done. Yes. Have they completed their research? No. Okay. Now, when you were here last, they had done an interim report. That's all we had at that point. That interim report didn't tell us much, yet you and not as much you, but others from Toyota assured the American people that it is not it is not the, uh, the, the, the whole uh, electronic system that it could possibly be the cause of the sudden acceleration. How, how, how could you be so sure about that? The, the only way that we can be sure, and, I, and I'm more confident today than I was in the past, is that we know that we do a lot of work and a lot of research before we put the vehicles on the road. And I know I'll have additional questions on that as well. Uh, today, as these smart teams are going out and investigating these, we've had 600. If, if but you we were told that you were relying on exponents' research and their conclusions, but you weren't relying on their conclusions because they hadn't finished their report. They still haven't finished their report. No, they still haven't finished. But but they're so you're relying on what you were told about the work that was being done in Japan before the products were put into mass uh, when production. Yes, and let me... Okay, and I raised some concerns about that in my opening statement. But let's go back to Exponent, because it's been, it's been held out to us that Exponent has put this issue to rest. That's why Exponent's doing this work. And, and, and I just can't understand why you're so absolutely certain, you say you're even more certain now than you were then, but still you haven't had Exponent's 
report. You're going to have it peer reviewed. Why are you bothering to do all that if you're absolutely convinced uh, based on, on the other work that you're doing? Because we want to ensure the, the public and our customers that they have the confidence that this has been reviewed independently, scientifically, peer reviewed, um, even, even having uh, Secretary Slater review the process. Former Secretary Slater. Former, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, well, we heard from the, the head of NHTSA, Mr. Strickland, and he doesn't feel that he can rely on what he knows of uh, exponents' work. Exponents seems to be working for the lawyers. You say it's not mutually exclusive for doing work for your corporations. But everything that they've shown us by way of documents gives us no sense that they've come to any conclusion. In fact, we have no sense they're even looking at this issue because uh, they, they, they don't even have it on the list of things that they're evaluating. Um, if exponents doing the job you describe in your testimony providing a comprehensive assessment, it presumably would be undertaking a complicated, multidisciplinary investigation involving numerous rounds of testing and analysis. But Dr. Suri told our staff that at any given time to 10 to 25 people could be working on the Toyota project and uh, there's no written communication among these people. There's nothing by way of any written notes. Um, science is what we need to have evaluated. So I, I, just, I just raised that issue. I still am not satisfied because uh, you're now relying on something other than exponent to give you that certainty. I want to ask you a different question before my time is up. And that's this question of the break override. Why are you doing a break override? What's the purpose of it? it it's to, to help with added consumer confidence on our products. Is it uh, for safety? I, I think for some people it could be safety. I, I can't speak for all the consumers. To, to say that 100% of the consumers will see that as safety. No, no, not how they well, see it. I don't care how they see it. Is it going to make the cars safer? There, there are other redundancies within a car today that will make that car stop. Today, even at full throttle, full brake pressure will stop. So you stop don't think the car. there's any safety need for it? I, I, I believe there is. Otherwise, we wouldn't be putting it on future models. But it does add consumer confidence. I can't tell you no, that it every seems consumer. To me you're saying something different here. You're saying. It'll make people feel better. That's consumer confidence. But are you willing to say that it's going to make the cars safer? I, I can't say 100% that it necessarily makes cars safer. It's, they're different. It's just like cars okay, well, let me, it, As I said, it costs around $50 to, to do this. But you're not doing it for all your cars. You're not going back. At, you're retrofitting some of the cars, but not others. Why, why, why have you made that decision? Don't, don't you feel that those who are driving less expensive Toyotas should have that uh, sense that uh, they have a, a brake override that's going to protect it's, them? It's, it's not a question of what people pay for their cars. We started, as I, as I mentioned before, we started with the four vehicles that had push button um, start. Are you going to get to the other vehicles? We then went to an additional three models that were high on the overall NHTSA complaint list. Are you going to get to all the other vehicles? We, are not, we will not get to all the other vehicles going back. Do you have a brake override in your car? Um, I drive a hybrid that has the equivalent of it. And why my, son, my son does not in his. And I don't feel, I'm under, what? my son does not have brake override in his vehicle, and I do not feel that he is not safe. Okay, but result. what if I, as a Toyota owner, wanted to spend $50 and get that in my car? If, if it hasn't been developed, it's a, it's, a, it's a total new software. If it's not developed, it's not Well, it's developed, developed enough for you're putting it in most of the Toyotas. It's, it's unique to each and every vehicle. But you're going to put it in all future Toyotas? Yes. Each and every vehicle for Toyota in the future? Yes, but it's unique. So you're retrofitting it for some of them, but not all of it them. It is unique to each and every vehicle going backwards. The, the, the amount of time that it would take yeah. to be able to, to do it is just not Mr. Lentz, with, with all due respect, what I hear you saying is you want people to feel good, so you tell them exponent has said that it's not the electronics, they should be assured. And I don't believe you can say that. That was the past, past testimony. You're saying people ought to feel good about the brake override, but you're not willing to say that that's really for safety. I, I, don't, I don't see that you're giving us assurances on safety. You're, it seems to me you're working around 
attitudes, and that attitude you want to develop is people should feel good about Toyota. I want to people to feel good about their safety. I understand, but I understand it is an extraordinary effort. I don't know of another manufacturer that has gone back to retrofit vehicles with any type of safety like this. So j even to do three million going back on these seven models is an extraordinary effort for any manufacturer to do. And my time is, I don't want to interrupt you if you're finished. No, it's fine, thank you. My time is more than expired. Thank you, for Mr. Chairman, for letting me go over. But I, I, as you can tell, I'm still not satisfied. Thank you. Ms. Christensen for questions, please. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Lenz, um, in the prior hearing, um, it seemed, and I sort of asked a question related to this before, all the major decisions were being made in Japan, at Toyota Japan. And there seemed to be a disconnect between what was happening with Toyota-made cars in different parts of the world. No communication, for example, what was happening in Europe with Toyota EU and Toyota US, for example. How would having a special committee on global quality and a chief quality officer have made a difference if those offices existed back then? The, 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 the biggest difference is uh, not only that we have a global quality officer, but we have an individual who is responsible for recalls now in the United States. The, the world has been divided up, up now into, I believe, it's six different regions. So Europe has a representative, China has a representative, the U.S. has a representative. They will share in all the information and all the data that's going on on a global basis. So if, if there was... That didn't happen before. That did not happen before. The decisions were made in Japan and communicated to us. Now that information will be visible to this individual, and this individual will work with one other person in Japan to make that decision whether or not that there's a recall or not. If he's not satisfied, Steve St. Angelo has the ability to go directly to Akio Toyota and discuss the situation. So not only do we have input now, but we can go all the way to the president of the company if we're not satisfied with what that decision is. So that's very, very different than before. Okay, and um, you have the North America Quality Advisory Panel. Um, they're appointed and paid by to Toyota? Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Slater w was initially uh, suggested by Toyota, and the, he basically handpicked the rest of the representatives on that committee. So, I mean, other than relying on the high respect that we have for the stewardship and the integrity of uh, uh, Rodney Slater, um, who may not always be, I mean, for any number of reasons he could leave, how do we ensure that this, there's adequate independence in this advisory panel? You know, I, I think you have to look at the results of what happens over the next few years. Um, we're, we are very confident that not only Mr. Slater, but the additional members of, of his panel. Uh, they, they've already spent time with, with our people. Uh, they've already spent time with Exponent. Um, and they, they seem to be very, very independent, uh, very, very uh, upfront, and are asking tremendous questions. And I think they're going to add tremendous value to our overall organization. And my last question, the initiatives such as SMART, are they happening? in the territories as well as in the states. Um, we have a big Toyota market in the Virgin Islands. Yeah, I, I can't tell you specific, specifically in the Virgin Islands. Our SMART team has not been requested to go. But after your comments today, I'm going to make sure that Japan understands if they need technical expertise, we will give them that assistance. I know on the engineering side, uh, from the TEMA side, that they do cover the Caribbean. Uh, our SMART team does not outside of Puerto Rico, which is under TMS control. Okay, uh, well, we Puerto Rico sure. covers the Vir U.S. Virgin Islands. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Braley for questions. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lentz, welcome back. Thank you. I want to explore in a little more detail Toyota's relationship with Exponent. When you appeared before the subcommittee on February 23rd of 2010, you submitted a written statement. Do you remember that? Yes. And on page two of your written statement, you said, we asked Exponent in December, a world-class engineering and scientific consulting firm, to conduct a comprehensive independent analysis of our electronic throttle control system 
with an unlimited budget. Do you recall making that statement? Yes, sir. And at the conclusion of that hearing, I requested a copy of any documents that would verify the nature of the relationship between Toyota and Exponent. And in response to that request, we received from your attorneys, King and Spaulding, a copy of a document listed as Attachment A, which we'll put up on the screen and which you have in front of you. And this is an agreement dated December 7, 2009, between Joel Smith at Bowman and Brook Law Firm in Columbia, South Carolina, with Exponent. Would you agree with that? Yes. And under the term subject, it says Toyota class actions. You see that? Yes. You know what a class action is? Yes, sir. It's a group of claims against a manufacturer that have been accumulated for the purpose of pursuing relief. Did I state that correctly? Yes. And then in the first paragraph, it says, Dear Joel, and then it outlines the scope of services under the agreement. It says, Our scope of services is anticipated to include engineering consulting services related to class actions filed against Toyota. Do you see that? Yes. And you would agree that class actions filed against Toyota are separate and distinct from an independent analysis of what's causing this problem. I understand that, but I can, I can tell you that... Well, let me just go on then to the rest of this, this letter. Down in paragraph three, it says... And this is an agreement between Bowman and Brook, a law firm in California, and Exponent. It says, it is our understanding that Exponent's retention on this project is solely with your organization. And the organization that Exponent is referring to is the law firm of Bowman and Brook. You would agree with that? Yes. And it says, all charges incurred by Exponent on this project, and that's the Toyota Class Action Project, will be the responsibility of Bowman and Brook, independent of other parties involved. Do you see that? Yes. So it's clear that when, when Exponent was first retained, they entered into an agreement with a law firm in South Carolina, not with Toyota directly, and the subject of that agreement was to investigate class action claims against Toyota. I understand. Correct? And we heard from Administrator Strickland, and he put this in perspective when he said there is preparation for litigation and there is scientific analysis consisting of a detailed analysis of the cause of a problem and eliminating it. You would agree there's a distinction. I, I don't know that for certain. Well, let's look at it because we also received in attachment D a summary of what Expona ha had been paid by Toyota over the years. And it says that between 2000 and 2009, Toyota paid Exponent about $11 million for consulting services, and during the, f the period between 2004 and 2009, it was $9.1 million. And there's a statement here, Exponent believes the result of the search provides a reasonable estimate of the gross revenues from Toyota, but they note that if that agreement does not specifically refer to Toyota by name, it may not show up in those revenues. So it's clear that Toyota in that decade had paid a substantial amount of money to Exponent. And my question for you is, how can you claim that Exponent was retained by Toyota to conduct an independent investigation when this agreement we've been provided with makes it clear that they were retained by your defense law firm and it was for contested litigation, which is in no way considered an independent analysis. That is how the relationship began. But as this has evolved, this has evolved. Well, as of this week, before you came here, reporting through product liability attorneys, that changed Correct. this week. Correct. And then the other thing I want to point out is we also asked questions from Toyota and received responses and I want those put up on the screen. Question and request number 15. It says the overall amount that Exponent has billed for work related to Toyota since Exponent was retained by Bowman and Brook on December 7, 2009, the answer the committee received was Exponent has billed $3,330,552.36. So you indicated in your written statement today that Exponent has already completed more than 11,000 hours of testing and analysis. That means that at 11,000 hours that they're billing about 
dollars an hour for this incredible amount of work that they've done on this project? I don't know. I don't know what the specific contract is. All, all I can say is I, I understand the, the perception that this is not a very transparent process. But you've and also provided us in your written statement today with this letter to Mr. Sabai, yes. who you've indicated will be communicating directly with uh, Mr. St. Angelo. Yes. And when Toyota's counsel talked to committee staff yesterday, they said that the letter to exponent that you provided with your attachment does not change exponent's contractual relationship with Bowman and Brook. Not yet. Is it I, your understanding I, that it will? I, I do not know that for a fact. But well, will I, you commit to the committee today that if it does, you will provide us with any documents that change the contractual relationship between Exponent and Bowman and Brook or Toyota and any of its various entities related to the project that we've been talking about during these two hearings? Absolutely. Right. I see my time has expired, and I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Braley. We wanted to go another round of questions, but we got four votes on the floor, plus the committee markup on the uh, bill, on the NHTSA bill. It takes place at 2 o'clock, and the uh, members can't be at two places, so we're going to have to cut it short. Uh, Mr. Lentz, uh, before I go, though, I did want to get into questions about the polling, but I can do that in writing, mm -hmm. and, and I, I'll follow these up. But last time you were here in uh, February, I asked you about, and a lot of discussions were about the event data recorders. Yes. We received no information yet on anything from the event data recorder, other than you provided some. But I had asked, uh, Mr. Rush had asked, and others had asked specifically about the uh, November 27, 2009 accident involving the 2010 Camry in Auburn, New York. I asked about December 26, 2009 accident in South Lake, Texas involving a 2008 Toyota Avalon. I asked about a Jeff Pip Pepsky of Minnesota 2007 Lexus ES350 about their uh, black box recorder. I also asked and questioned you on the February 20th, 2010 Washington Post article on the Camrys in 2005. In fact, that's about Camrys again. Three fatal accidents, and of course, the 2005 Camry is not subject to any sudden unattended acceleration, even though the three fatal accidents here did. Uh, we're looking for the information on the black box recorders. I will follow it up in writing, but uh, that and other questions I have. I, I apologize if we haven't submitted that to you. Um, I, I, I can tell you that the black box recorders, we've lived up to the commitment that we made that we, will ha that we have 150 of the, uh, the devices, the data uh, retrieval devices in the marketplace. Um, I, I can also tell you that- Correct, but we want to know what they say. Yeah, but I, but I can also tell you that they will be made commercially available. Uh, by probably about September of 2011 to make it much more readily available for police across the United States. And consumers, I hope. Yep, and consumers will have access. Because that will be part of the bill today. To their data. So, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, so, but we'll follow those up, Mr. Braley, quickly because we got to run yes, time. Before you close the cheering, I would just ask that the response from King and Spalding that we okay. received with Thanks. all of the relevant attachments and the email that we had up on the screen dated Wednesday, May 19th, with the answers to questions number 15 and 16 be included as part of I would have no problem as long as we had some redactions on some of the names. That would be the only thing I, I would I'd have to insist upon. Other than that, I have no objection. you have any objection as long as we redact the names? Oh, I, I, just, I'm, I have a question for the chairman why we would redact names that have been provided in response to an official request. Uh, because we've, uh, that's been our policy in the past. If they're not subject to it, the names of those individuals, those engineers by exponent, uh, their names don't need to be in the public record. Well, the only, only exception I would request then, Mr. Chairman, is there are people that uh, Mr. Sabai is listed as the very first person in that answer. And since he has been the subject of the discussion at the hearing, and there's no question based on the letter that he, that the uh, Correct. witness has provided that his name be left and not Correct. Rejected. Okay, without objection. So be included with redactions of the professional engineers who were not subject to or signed that letter. Okay, that concludes all. Mr. Chairman, if, just one observation since everyone else has gone over. All right. We're going to, a, well, you're going to a markup at Commerce, Trade, and Consumer Protection. I'm no longer on that subcommittee, but you're going to mark up legislation, and we haven't finished 
our work here that is supposed to inform the legislation that is being marked up this afternoon. I mean, there are huge discrepancies and huge holes that need to be filled uh, with the, the, the need to get this done so The, the legislation we're marking up does not just include this subject of this hearing, Toyota, well, I, it's also I, others. There's also been hearings on the legislation. Uh, that witnesses but have testified. We, I know you're not on the subcommittee, but, but we before do this it comes, time and uh, reclaiming my time, we do this time and time again. You don't have any we time. The, we did it with clean water. We and now we're doing it with this uh, with this bill this afternoon. It, it just seems like the committee should take things in in a in a in a methodical way and not be doing these things in a haphazard uh, arrangement that seems to be so prevalent right now in the committee. Okay. And okay. Well, we, thank we, you for your indulgence. Right. I'll yield. You'll have a chance to voice those objections when it comes to the full committee, because as you know, when it goes to the subcommittee level, it must come to the full committee before we have a markup at the full committee level. So you have a chance to participate then. Well, that concludes all questioning. I want to thank all of our witnesses for coming today and for your testimony. The committee rules provide members have 10 days to submit additional questions for the record. I ask unanimous consent that the contents of document and binder be entered in record, provided that the committee staff may redact any information as business proprietary relates to privacy concerns or law enforcement sensitive. Without objection, the documents will be entered in the record. Before I close this hearing, let me acknowledge two key staff persons, Ann Tyndale of the Democratic staff and Karen Christensen of the Republican staff. Both these women are expecting a child very soon. We appreciate the work they put in on this hearing and previous hearings for this committee and our subcommittee. We wish them well in the coming days and weeks ahead as they transition from work exhaustion to <laughs> childbirth exhaustion. <laughs> that will conclude our hearing. The meeting of this subcommittee is adjourned. Thank you. The Senate today cleared a major hurdle on a financial regulations bill. We'll get reaction from President Obama, who supports the legislation next on C-SPAN. Mexican President Calderon